And I just want to talk a little bit about the WHO, the World Health Organization. And I want to read a quote from my book, actually. It's the first quote in my book, and it says, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that was written by the World Health Organization in 1948. So it's, it's changed a little bit now, and we're going to dive into that a bit. But you must have, when you went to work for the World Health Organization, you worked for them for nine years, I believe. Uh, and you, were, you never took any funding from the big pharmaceutical companies. No, I want to just highlight that I have no conflicts of interest. I've never taken funding from uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so um, it's kind of why my work has been was always valued, because I could declare no conflicts of interest uh, with, with the WHO work as well. And that's quite rare, isn't it? Yes, it's very rare. It's sort of, uh, I, I've been an academic outside of uh, academic institutions um, and uh, and outside of the the corporate pharmaceutical industry too. When did you realise that the WHO was maybe not what you thought it was? Well, you know, some years ago, I had a real sense of frustration because uh, I always, you know, I wanted to make a difference. It was why I I was excited about my work there in the first instance, because it felt like one could make a difference on a large scale, you know. We came to you know to realize that we we were just sort of putting band aids on things and um, we weren't really affecting health um, and improving health at a grassroots level. So I w- I wasn't sure how it could be different and, and what we could be doing differently, what I could be doing differently. But I certainly was uh, more and more disillusioned sort of in the in the late 2000s, 2018, 2019, and I also started to see the influence of private industries. So there was a lot of um, sort of uh, lobbying for funding from the Gates Foundation, for example. And uh, and when that money came in, it was for certain projects um, rather than um, for, you know, what, what might be assessed as necessary. So so there was that and, and um, there was pushback. I started to see pushback when we made a recommendation that was unpopular, um, that there would be pushback uh, from the Gates Foundation or or groups linked to to the Gates Foundation. So I was con- uh, increasingly concerned about the influence of, in particular, the Gates Foundation uh, on the workings of the and uh, and on the um, the output of the World Health Organization. Yes, I, I think a lot of us have those concerns. And I just want to talk now about the fact that we have the WHO treaty coming into Parliament. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that and then move on to what seems to be an even greater concern. So can we just unwrap that for a bit? Yes, well, you know, I think people don't realise that it's not just this WHO treaty that is the issue. There's a number of documents that are in the process of being amended or drafted afresh um, to um, empower the WHO with the 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 power to 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 really influence uh, individual health uh, around the world in a negative way um, by removing um, the rights of people to make their own to be free to make their own choices and to to sort of under the sort of uh, what they're calling a one health approach um, uh, make um, recommendations and uh, mandates for uh, any number of things that affect our health animals and the planet Um, so we're seeing the real broadening of scope through these documents now two complementary documents uh, are the who pandemic treaty also called the accord or the ca2 plus um, and they keep changing the name so that we not, you know, so that keep people confused. Uh, but the the other one, which is actually more important because it's an existing document, is the international health regulations from two thousand and five, and the amendments that are being proposed on that um, with re- with respect to this document. Now, this is so. This is a document that was drafted in two thousand and five, uh, and in it, the WHO um, advises and and um, countries can choose whether to follow the advice or not. It's a legally binding document. But in the the amendments, um, there are a number of 
uh, amendments that actually make this uh, make the WHO recommendations legally binding. So it changes from advisory to legally binding and mandatory. Um, and countries are obliged to implement what the WHO recommends on a, on a broad scope of what they call public health emergencies of international concern. And this ranges from pandemics to climate emergencies to uh, a wide range of, of uh, emergencies that the director general of the WHO then has the power to call. And they don't have to be actual emergencies, they can be potential emergencies too. So, um, you know, we saw with the monkeypox pandemic last year um, that the director general of the WHO overruled his committee, which, which recommended against declaring a pandemic for monkeypox. And monkeypox was declared on the whim, on his whim, uh, and then obviously they, they just sort of faded into the into the into the ether when it was clear that there was no pandemic at all. But you know that was just an, a very real example of what can happen when you when so much power is invested in an actual fact one person who is really of uh, uh, the, the current director general is really of of uh, ill repute anyway, and uh, so. But, you know, no one should ever have that amount of power. And so what we're seeing is these documents are actually, um, they're being used to construct a corporate um, government um, out, of the, um, out of the World Health Organization. So by empowering the World Health Organization, um, which is actually increasingly corporate run um, by, by um, unelected and un, um, unidentified, you know, supranational mm -hmm. organizations and individuals, um, you know, we're seeing that that this is being used as a vehicle to do that and pandemics and the and whatever fakes they're called the public health emergencies of international concerns, um, they, they are being um, they're, they're tools really to make people fearful and acquiesce and, and comply with whatever new new uh, thing comes out. And I know I'm talking a lot, but on the last thing, if I could just say the real risk, because many people think, oh, well, my government won't do this. And so what, you know, so if, if our politicians say, um, you know, we're not going to lose our sovereignty, well, I'm going to just trust them. What people need to realize is that what this new system does is it actually empowers our governments to, um, to, uh, um, mandate all sorts of measures on us that give them a tremendous power and they say well it's it's not our our uh, fault we have to do this because we're in this legally binding agreement for the sake of the the world the greater good and we're a part of this agreement and so we have to lock you lock you up lock you down uh, inject you um, mandate all, all all manner of things for the sake of the planet and and other things so um it's really to to realize that uh it gives our governments power over us which they quite like